Good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to this afternoon's webinar, Managing CIP Risk, Change Orders, and Budget Revisions at UC Southwestern Medical Center. My name is Sergio Aranda, Product Marketing Manager at eBuilder, provider of web-based capital program and project management software. Today's webinar, part of eBuilder's 2010 Knowledge Sharing Initiative, will be led by Mr. Guillermo Ramos, Director of CIP over at UC Southwestern Medical Center. Guillermo, thank you so much for leading today's webinar. Oh, thank you for the invitation. Moderating the presentation will be Mr. Jonathan Entevi, co-founder and CEO of eBuilder. How are you doing, John? I'm doing great. So before we start, I just wanted to give everybody a quick overview of eBuilder for those of you that are not familiar with the company. eBuilder provides web-based capital program management to North America's largest owners, program managers, and the architecture and construction companies that work on their behalf. John, before turning it over to you, I just want to give our attendees a little bit of background for some of you that are new to our webinar series. Mr. Guillermo Ramos has over 20 years of experience, mainly in healthcare and higher education settings. And prior to his current position with the UT Southwestern Medical Center, he was Director of Construction for Mount Sinai Medical Center at Miami Heart Institute in Miami, Florida. While at Mount Sinai, he was responsible for managing all the renovations, infrastructure upgrades, and planning of a new patient tower and implemented an electronic construction software to account for over $100 million in capital improvement. From 1991 to 2001, Guillermo was with the University of Miami and the Sylvester Cancer Center, where he was responsible for facilities, safety, and a variety of large-scale capital projects and facilities maintenance for South Florida's premier cancer center. Guillermo holds a Master's in Business Administration from the University of Miami, as well as a Bachelor of Science in Construction Management from Florida International University. John is co-founder and CEO of eBuilder, Pioneers in Capital Program and Project Management Solutions. John is an architect with a master's degree in construction management. While working as a pre-construction specialist, John experienced firsthand some of the challenges and frustrations associated with inefficient processes, poor cost management practices, and lack of structured project information management. This inspired John to focus his master's thesis on the use of the Internet as a way to improve communications, collaboration, and strategically leveraging project cost and schedule data. John, without any further delay, I'd like to turn it over to you. Thanks, Sergio. And before uh, I, I get started, if you can just go ahead and run that poll so Guillermo and I can get a sense of the makeup of the audience. We have over 100 people today on the call. I suspect, Guillermo, there's going to be a lot of questions, so I'm going to pick and choose uh, where appropriate and during, during some of the silent pauses that you have between slides. So each of you now uh, should see a question, which of the following best describes your organization? And you can go ahead and select one. And Sergio will let that run for about 10 or 15 seconds as we get about 80% response. And uh, we'll have Sergio read back the actual results so Guillermo and I can have an idea of the, uh, the makeup of the audience today. All right, so let me close that poll and show the results. Perfect. The 38% owners, 32% owner rep program managers, and then the contractor and architects uh, is about 12 and 16%, and then sub suppliers about 1%. So this is actually a very good group, uh, and it's, it's a good makeup for what we're going to be talking about today. Uh, those of you that haven't seen Guillermo in action, and I have been fortunate enough to see him uh, implement a system. Uh, there's much more than even just the software today that uh, he's going to talk about. And it's his leadership style. It's his ability to bring all the different parties who are using their own contractor system. It's the ability to bring in his own people within his financial group to have their own financial system. How do you get all these different groups who have different systems, different wants and needs, or coming together on a project for maybe a year or two? Uh, to go ahead and work together on a system. And what he's going to do is talk about some of those uh, characteristics and some of those leadership styles as well as some of the tactics that he's used uh, to truly have a successful program uh, using these systems and, and like eBuilder. And ultimately, how do you manage uh, the risk on his project 
uh, including the change owners, uh, change orders, and uh, certainly all the budget revisions. So Guillermo, let me turn it over to you, and uh, I'll be uh, interrupting as people ask questions where appropriate. All righty. Um, and you'll get the screen back. And I believe we actually had the agenda, which is going to come up here as the next one that uh, uh, will give everyone the overview. So uh, Guillermo is going to start with the overview, of course, of his program, talk about some of the potential risks. Uh, there's this big notion about the old way. How have we worked in the old way and problems with the old way? Uh, managing risk, of course, in today's economic times is going to be the fourth bullet. He's going to give quite a number of examples and then ultimately end off with the benefits. Uh, okay, I'm not <clears> seeing the... Uh, all right. The Just um, to give a little bit of background about uh, myself here at UT Southwestern. Um, I've been here for two and a half years. Uh, UT Southwestern started managing their, managing their own capital projects, um, I believe, within the last 10 years. Uh, the department is is pretty new, so the uh, department is probably um, is like seven years old. Capital managing capital projects. Uh, their first capital project they managed was um, an ambulatory facility, 30 30 million dollars. So, managing uh, capital projects is is new to to this campus. Uh, they've been doing it for a while, but I've been here two and a half years. So when I arrived here two and a half years ago, um, everything was on Excel spreadsheets and so on, and and the the size of the projects are, are really large, uh, 200 million, 30 million, and so on. So um, as you can see, our campus, if you're not familiar with our campus, there's about 9,000 employees, um, 4,000 medical graduate allied health students, residents, you know, and so on. They're um, uh, they're trained here every year. We have 11 million uh, square feet, approximately 11 million. 452 beds belong to UT Southwestern. Right next to us, we have another facility, it's Parkland Hospital, which is huge, and they have 983 beds. And then Children's Hospital and all these facilities work together. Recent major projects that we're moving ahead, we actually completed last year, was a bio center for. Uh, 30 million approximately and 112,000 square feet. A lab research facility that now we're building um, is 200 million, about 356,000 square feet. The um, the biggest project um, that we're now pursuing, which is uh, a huge challenge for all of us, and it's one of the largest, because we're one of the largest that UT system has built over the years, is our new university hospital, which is two phases. Um, so total budget of that is uh, 800 million. Now, let's see here. Um, for all those owners and owners rep, uh, when we're, we're all managing multiple projects, you know the challenge that every project has a long list of things that are happening, issues, and so on. Uh, the ones that are usually well documented are the RFIs. Um, so the challenge and the and the risks are I listed here are I think everybody can relate to. Uh, projects are complex, um, quality assurance program, inspections and uh, commissioning and uh, architectural, all these inspections and field observation occurring on a constant basis on facilities. How do you track them all uh, when you're especially in my role and I'm the owner and there's multiple projects happening and we're responsible for all of them. Um, we are dealing with multiple construction managers, so right now we're uh, managing, we're working with Hunt, Turner, Whiting, Turner, Austin Commercial. Um, last year we had Gilbane on board. So everybody has, usually typically everybody has their own system, uh, Prolog and other softwares, and everybody generates reports, everybody is um, and, uh, working from their own system, which is information is all scattered throughout the projects. Um, we have tough RFPs and requirements and schedule constraints are always uh, an issue for all of us. Change orders, um, always a risk for us, cost impact on foreseen. Uh, where are they as far as uh, status of getting them approved and so on. Budget reallocations um, is another risk for us that we've over, you know, we've seen here over the years and my experience also is how do we document properly the the reallocation of monies in the budget so that everybody's on the same page. Um, 
and then access for informa to information um, to make inf informed decision quickly. So, um, and this relates to the risk of being able to make a quick decision based on facts and being fair to everybody. How do you get your hands on all the facts quickly so that you can not delay, you can prevent a delay in the project and be able to move on? And then uh, we all love that part, which is the closeout and the warranty period. And uh, usually there are warranty issues and the risk associated with warranties because you want to make sure that that you get these warranty issues taken care of before the warranty expires, which is one year. And how do you document if that warranty issue has been completed or not? So um, I was, uh, we look for different software out there, software systems and so on, and um, and we're happy to found and be able to implement eBuilder, um, which has been a huge uh, improvement to us as far as our ability to manage all these projects. So um, our structure is pretty simple. Right now for the hospital component, um, do you uh, see my, my pointer moving around, Serge? No. You're doing we it. We do. You see my pointer? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. So, um, so we're pretty simple. We have a very simple structure for the hospital. And this, part, this org chart just focuses on the hospital. So we have um, hired Adams Management. And they've they have uh, a project man senior project manager project manager two project managers and later on during construction these other folks will get on board everybody that you see in yellow is really outside consultants that are uh, provide services from scheduling consulting to to cost estimating and so on and uh, exterior commissioning so folks and so on the only folks that are on our team uh, directly to UT Southwestern CIP department are the folks in the dark blue uh, boxes. So just to give you an idea of, um, and right now we are managing the $800 million hospital you know, project and also um, the $200 million lab research. And there's other projects there like uh, BSL-4, uh, actually BSL-3 that we're managing a fit out or finish out of a lab research facility. So all these projects are going on and how do we get all these people, all these folks to communicate and for us to have all the centralized information because every project has issues out there. There's a risk to UT Southwestern and our goal was to bring it all together into one location and make sure that we're able to manage it and make sure that we clearly understand what's going on in each project on a daily basis that it's live data coming from from cost to project issues and so on. So that just gives you a quick overview of our organization there. Okay. So on to the next Guillermo. one. Sure. Guillermo, we have a couple questions. Uh, the first is on your previous slide where you talked about potential risk. Someone asked, what, would that have list have been shorter if, uh, if it would have not been for these tough economic times? And then once you answer that, I have a the follow up. Uh, can you go back to the list? I'm just wondering. Yeah, the, the, ha, has the economic climate uh, of the past year or two made this list longer, or would it have been shorter uh, in previous years where the times were better? No, not at all. Um, I don't think the economy has really affected the list of potential risk. I think these are risks that occur every time you have a project. Uh, okay. There's always, there's, so that's... You know, it's, there's always budget issues, change order issues, schedule, quality concerns and issues. Uh, every project, usually in healthcare, is complex. Um, so, no, these these things are typical of, of most capital projects. Okay, and then the follow-up question: uh, Someone said that all the blue boxes are blue of your people that are working for you, and their comment is: uh, Is that more or less? in your experience of an $800 million project of this size? Well, um, based on, if go back to the org chart, not too many folks have done an $800 million project. I definitely have not. And um, based on what I've heard of other organizations, this is less than other models that are used out there for uh, managing capital projects or close to or similar to this. Um, we definitely we definitely feel that that uh, 
we have the right amount of staff on board and uh, that we're lean, but we're, we're effective and we haven't had any issues at all. And there's some other folks, there's one senior project manager that's not listed on here, but he's, his focus is uh, the $200 million uh, uh, lab research facility. So, um, so you know, we do have another senior project manager that's not listed here, but he's, his focus is outside in the, the research facility. Great, thank you. All right, on to the next one. It takes about a second or two. Okay. So I think we've all been there where we've been using Excel spreadsheets to track all the expenses. Uh, that's a similar challenge that I had when I was in Mount Sinai um, and University of Miami when we were tracking expenses and so on, especially in Mount Sinai where we were dealing with multiple capital projects in a very short duration. Um, and then... Um, when I came over here two and a half years ago, we had a very similar situation uh, where we were tracking, and this is a typical spreadsheet that we use, we track all our change orders, all our expenses, all everything on a, on a spreadsheet. The, the highest risk there is that you're really depending on one individual. I was depending on one individual to kind of be able to know the ins and outs. If that person wins the lottery, I would be in deep trouble. <laughs> and um, And also, when it got down to uh, a VP or somebody, business affairs or somebody wanting a report right away of live data, you know, being able to tell me where do we stand today. It always, there was always a uh, delay in trying to make sure that the act, the information was accurate. So uh, that was, that was a, always a challenge. So we definitely wanted to move away from this into a system where we just enter data and be able to not have to depend on one individual to keep all the the information. So, um, if you're not familiar with it, you know that's it's um, the next slide, John. Yeah, and actually, you have control now. So when you click, oh, you are? Guillermo, uh, just give it about a second or two. Oh, is that the issue? I'm impatient. Yeah, be patient. Yeah. <laughs> Got it. So, so now this is just a quick picture of where we are. Um, we do have two contract administrators that enter data. Uh, before we had one, but since we moved on to more. Uh, more projects, and also our contract administrator is planned to retire like maybe one or two years. So we thought that the, the best balance is to have two, and right now we have um, their responsibility is to enter uh, invoices, contracts, purchase orders, and so on, and and um, be able to maintain the data being, you know, the cost reports and so on to be accurate and as far as um, up-to-date. So really, we right now we consider a lot of the data that we have related to costs as, as live because even whenever the contractor enters or submits a, a PC, which is a potential change, we haven't reviewed it, we haven't negotiated or anything, it goes into as a liability. So we know what's out there as far as liabilities, potential liabilities that could impact the project uh, budget. So we have a uh, question from one of the sure. contractors that, uh, asking, um, do you allow your contractors to see uh, the information on this screen here in this financial summary? No, the cost module is not available to the contractor, but he, um, there's really no need for him to see the, the owner's budget, you can say. His cost is all um, the change order process and everything is, is over at the, in the forms module, uh, which I think you might see in a little bit. Great, thank you. All right, so like I said, uh, the old way to how we used to do things, and I think a lot of us, especially owners, have, uh, are there or have been there. Uh, project accounting, um, I mentioned the high risk related to human error. It's always there. Uh, and again, someone could quit on you, somebody could be sick, and all of a sudden you're faced with uh, not being able to, to generate information or cost report to be able to get out of commission from that perspective. Risk of cost reports not being up to date, I mentioned earlier. Uh, risk of depending on one individual. Budget changes. That's something that is um, a new uh, issue that came up recently where administration was wanted to make sure that one day or a year or two years from now, uh, you know, right now, let's see, our budget for equipment is $90 million, that one day they would show up and, and I would tell them, no, right now our equipment budget is only $40 million. 
And in the interest of making sure that everybody, you know, as we all know, the budget changes throughout the project, and we reallocate funds from one point to the other, and depending on who approves it and so on. We wanted to make sure that everybody um, was on the same page. So the risk of not being able to communicate um, uh, the budget changes was one issue that we wanted to deal with, and we used uh, eBuilder recently in the process. Change orders, definitely, it's it's um, it's a fact of life when managing projects and, and being able to have all the facts available and so on. And then tracking all issues. Um, and we all know that uh, on projects there's always an extensive no number of issues and, and concerns from all different angles. The ones that are usually well documented by the contractors are RFIs. There's a list. And what about everything else? Everything else is communicated through emails, through meeting minutes, and how does that get tracked and make sure that no one, none of those issues fall through the crack? So those are uh, the issues that we were, that uh, the risk that we were trying to manage. And um, and let's see here. Let's see if it works this time. And, and uh, Guillermo, someone asked here, since virtually all consultants and contractors invoice on a monthly basis, and these are generally entered at the end of the month, are you seeing real value in, quote, live accounting that you mentioned? Uh, yes. But remember that live accounting includes um, all the PCs that are ongoing throughout the project. So all the PCs also, they get entered, they get submitted throughout the month. So, and also the PCs get approved throughout the month. So as those PCs become increases to the contractor, um, you're getting a more accurate where are you with commitments and potential commitments and so on. Great, thank you. So before, uh, on the previous slide, I showed you the risks that we, that, the challenges that we had. And uh, the way we managed it is uh, the following. All the consultants and contractors um, are required to use eBuilder. So on the uh, when I when we implemented eBuilder, it was uh, kind of difficult because some of the projects were already in foundation, and and you know some of the contractors already had a process or a prologue or any, you know some other system. So there was some resistance to using RFIs. Some other contractors um, were very open. To uh, implementing this in the right away, they submitted you know all the RFIs and everything throughout. But new projects here at UT Southwestern, it is in the architect's contract, it is in the contractors construction manager contract that they're going to use eBuilder as a means for communicating all throughout the project. So what do they communicate? Is uh, all issues. So remember I mentioned to you that RFIs are very well tracked by the contractor, but what about everything else? It could be as simple as a concern that somebody goes out, any of our inspectors or any anyone could go out there and see some safety deficiency or safety concern. And um, how do we track that to make sure that doesn't fall through the crack and somebody's taking care of it? Um, we all use meeting minutes on a weekly basis to go over who's doing what, but um, what we've learned, what we've seen is that that all the issues are not tracked on the meeting minutes. And a lot of times we refer to the outstanding issues log or project issues log to remind us that these things are still pending and what are we doing about it, whose court is on. So all issues are tracked on, uh, on we use eBuild to track all issues. RFIs, um, the contractors required to submit all RFIs through eBuilder. Um, all PCs and change orders are submitted through there. Even the architect, when he submits addendums, ASIs, or PRs, even his additional services, which is a change order to the architect's um, contract, he submits it through eBuilder. And it's logged in as a liability until we approve the PC and then becomes it gets added to his commitments. All submittals are being um, uh, sent through eBuilder on all projects uh, and I'm specifically saying the new ones because uh, like the lab research facility that I mentioned earlier that's that uh, it's 200 million um, those was 
you know, implemented a little bit too late in the in the construction phase to to be able to uh, be able to implement that. We, since we are exempt um, from the um, building department and so on, because we're state agencies, um, we do we are responsible for our own quality assurance. So our own ins our inspectors, the results of the inspections and the uh, any deficiencies and so on are all tracked um, on eBuilder. Um, safety deficiencies also, as again, you know, safety is really important to us. So we want to make sure nothing falls through the cracks. So if there's any safety deficiencies out there, um, is documented and sent to the contractor and never goes away until he has resolved it, and we follow up with the issue on a weekly basis. Uh, we also have uh, insurance uh, companies called Marsh. We're we're in a ROSA program, so they come out weekly and inspect, and the results of their inspections are also documented on eBuilder and sent to the contractor for his actions. And like I said, the, at the end of the project, there's all those closeout issues and warranty and status of substantial completion, and we track those on eBuilder to make sure that um, all the warranty items have been fixed and um, before the one year uh, expires. So, so again, just I highlighted here that all the above cannot be deleted or forgotten about. So this is our way of managing, making sure that all the important issues in the project cannot just be forgotten about or deleted by accident or or looked, you know, um, or fall through the crack. So that's how we manage all those challenges and risks that are associated with those um, items. The other thing we – go ahead, John. Yeah, Gamer, let me hit you up with about five or six questions. Some of these are more rapid fire. Uh, first is, what's the delivery method? Is it designed to build, CM, team at risk, et cetera, on these projects? The uh, All our capital projects are CM at risk. The smaller projects, very small projects, um, which I – barely can count on my finger, you know, it's just my hands are very few that we sometimes do lump sum, but they're very small tenant improvement projects that uh, we usually don't get involved with. Okay. Are you using eBuilder during the design process to track owner-related design issues? Absolutely. So um, one of the things that we have is peer review, especially in the hospital being so large and important to us, we've actually hired an, a, a separate architectural firm to help us with peer review. So um, all their comments have been submitted through eBuilder in a form called design review comments. And all we have uh, also another organization called Shermer Engineering, who is our life safety uh, expert. We have a commissioning agent um, for the envelope and a commissioning agent for the MEP. All their comments are sent through eBuilder to the architect, who is RTKL. And it's on their list to be done for them to respond. And when they respond, they will respond using eBuilder by attaching their response to the form and sending it back to, in our case, the peer, our peer reviews uh, and partners. And they will go ahead and, and uh, so we always know who is sitting on what at all times and who's behind or late on responding. Okay. Another one here is AE firms and contractors have their own systems, such as Prolog, Turner Talk, et cetera. They have difficulty, or was there resistance in moving data from their system build? Right. There was some uh, resistance with um, making the transition, especially um, on one project. And they, they um, since we started a little late, we didn't force the issue with RFIs because they had started RFIs in that project. But another contractor who also uses Prolog was welcomed um, and had no objections to using uh, eBuilder for RFIs, change orders, and so on. And I never heard any complaints from them, and it worked out really good. And the new projects, it's a requirement. And if the contractor feels very strong that they have to enter it in Prolog, that's really up to them. Um, we try. We we try to convince them not to do that because that would be double entry, but um, but it's up to them. I, the only thing I what we do is say uh, if you want to submit an RFI to the architect, it's going to go through eBuilder. Okay, and uh, I'm going to let you continue on your other slide, and then I'll uh, I'll promise I'll get to a bunch of these questions. Sure. Like another ten more that have popped sure. up. So. 
Um, the other item I just want to mention to everyone is that we do also we um, we centralized all the documents in one location. So the the entire team, the architect, engineers, uh, contractor, uh, all our outside consultants, Shermer, everybody has access to one location to all the project files. All the drawings are there. All the meeting minutes are there. It's organized into design phase and construction phase, you can say. Obviously, the design phase, the architect has more control over those folders. And the contractor has more control over the contractor side when we get to construction. But it's a grade has been very successful in us having to centralize all the information into one location, one centralized file. And, um, and you know, it's been really, really productive. We have actually gone, I know the term is out there is paperless, but the other day somebody came up to me, one of our staff member, project coordinator, and asking if we needed to update our folder structure out there in the filing cabinet. And it just made me realize that we're not filing things away anymore. Everything is an e-builder. All the facts are an e-builder. When there's never a project issue, all the facts related to that, all the letters or any memo, if somebody for some reason felt they had to send me a letter, it's right there in that project issue. So I can always go back to that. Um, the same thing with, with change orders. All the backup to the change order is in one form, an e-builder, in that PC form. So we we actually are upsizing. You know, we're we're expanding our office because we we brought in Adam. So until we get our trailers on site at the new hospital site, they're living here. So we added a couple of offices. So we've actually talking about reducing the amount of filing cabinets in our office space. Just to give you an example, that we're going um, less paper. The shop drawings and things like that will not go away um, per project. Because that's you know much easier to read. Most of my inspectors prefer to be able to read the shop drawings with a large set versus looking at something on a screen. I think we all agree with that. But uh, but we've have all the PCs, all the correspondence, and everything as we've gone paperless on that. Um, automated weekly reports. Uh, so how do we keep track of all these things, and how do we notify everybody where they stand and who's behind on responding to issues? Um, we have generated um, automated subscriptions or weekly reports or get sent out to the team and that list these are the issues that are pending on this project uh, these are the overdue dates on on the items and it clearly states who's who's who has what on their court so it has been a, a, a huge benefit for all of us in being able to manage all the issues in, in the project John, how are we doing with time? Good? Yep, we're about uh, a little more than halfway there. Okay. Do you have any other questions now uh, moving on to the next one? Uh, I do. Uh, you, Someone asked when you talked about the RFI change order and resolution process, they want to know how many people are actually employed in that process uh, using eBuilder. Um, it's actually uh, very simple. The project project manager uh, has a project engineer. I'm talking about the contractor. The contractor has a project engineer that feeds the uh, PC information into eBuilder. He enters the information. He sends it to the architect for his review and copies the, our project manager. So the architect reviews it. My project manager reviews it at the same time. If the architect and MEP engineer is okay with the PC, doesn't have any questions, he sends it over to my project manager for approval. Uh, if there's issues related to it, he responds. He replies back with that form back to the contractor and tells them that you know whatever the comment that he needs to provide something else. It could be additional backup. Doesn't agree with the the you know the rates or whatever it is. But that PC is you clearly see where that PC and what was the the last comment and the whole history. So. If we get in, ever into an issue where my project manager says this, you know, this issue, this PC, we haven't been able to resolve with the contractor because of X reason, I could easily go back on eBuilder to look for that PC and clearly see the history 
of that PC from day one and catch up right away without opening a uh, filing cabinet or anything like that. Okay, and a follow-on to that, you talked about the warranty period, and they're asking, how is all the project documentation copied or provided to the other architect subs and consultants? Because in this particular person's case, they're required to keep project documents anywhere from three to seven years pending state requirements. We keep the documents anyway. Um, so the as it relates to, are they saying as it relates to closeout documents? Yeah, warranty and closeout documents. Uh, we still get the traditional, the required um, CAD drawings, closeout documents, warranty. The actual project manual is uploaded to eBuilder, and we have access to it. We actually have a, sh uh, a SharePoint for physical plant to have access to um, uh, a centralized folder structure for physical plant is more of a UT Southwestern that they have access to. So uh, we, we still you know, keep the records for the amount of time. And we have an archive for all invoices, all contracts, and so on um, that we still try to keep, keep in uh, as far as, you know, for a certain duration of time. Great. Thank you. So, um, so the forms module I mentioned to you, so how do we manage all these things? Um, there is a forms module, a cost module, and then I mentioned right now earlier a documents module, and, um, and I'll mention a managing budget changes revision. So uh, like I said before, a forms module, we track every project issue in the project, um, and um, we use it to make sure nothing falls through the cracks and nothing is forgotten about. If it's important enough to send an email on someone to take an action on, then we do it through uh, by creating a project issue to make sure that it never is never forgotten about. All PCs are there's a form for all PCs. They're all submitted through PCs. Um, at this time, the only time that we actually uh, print the PC is when we uh, t submit it to administration for approval. Then we bring it back. We scan it and then we send it to a contractor um, via eBuilder to show, you know, to, for his record that the PC has been approved and he can convert that to a change order. Uh, schedule, on a recent project, we had a couple of claims for time extension and we started tracking the time extension request from day one um, when the contractor um, started you know, re requesting the time and because everything was very neatly organized and everything well documented and response time and so on, we were able to avoid uh, a um, kind of uh, a time extension based on, on the claim that could have been additional general conditions to UT Southwestern. So I think everybody has been there where whoever has the most facts and information kind of wins, uh, obviously the negotiation piece or the uh, the discussion. So having information, uh, very accurate information and where do we stand, and our interest is to be fair to everybody. So it's very important to us to make sure that all the facts are there for UT Southwestern to make a, a, uh, a fair decision on whenever there's time extension requests or change orders and so on. And as I mentioned, uh, we do have our own inspectors quality assurance program, and we do rely on on external folks, uh, consultants, like commissioning agents, and uh, they generate reports, deficiency logs, and so on, and how do we track those, and they fill out a form, send it to the contractor, and again, um, nothing is forgotten about until the person who creates, uh, who, the person who created that form is not satisfied with the resolution of the issue, it doesn't go away. So um, that's how we manage all those items as far as. So cost modules, um, we do track our commitment invoices, change orders, and potential change orders. Uh, document document uh, module, like I said earlier, everything is centralized in one location. And then uh, managing budget changes and revisions is really new. We implemented a process for managing. And this is kind of a quick picture of, of our budget process, but we've simplified it by being able to use eBuilder and just uh, it's a very simple form now when we track it through eBuilder but it could get complicated if we if you count if we counted on just uh, passing the paper around. Okay, 
Guillermo, we have a few. Uh, first, I have a question on, on the slide that you just talked about, these, you know, the change order and the time extension, uh, you know, and the delays that some of these contractors are asking for. Were you able to put a dollar amount on any of those areas and say, you know what, through the use of a system like e-building, uh, you were able to save a bunch of money or avert a potential claim that would have cost you a certain amount of money? Well, there was one claim for general conditions was uh, about $30,000. And uh, general conditions get add up pretty fast on a capital project because monthly general conditions are high. And um, we were able to uh, be able to uh, actually uh, liquidate damages were, were implemented because of uh, the claim was not justified. And at the same time, we were able to eliminate the additional cost of general conditions. So, um, you know, we picked up on the liquidity damages and also avoided a additional cost of 30000 for general conditions. Most important, it kept the heat on to try to finish as close as possible to the schedule, that the original schedule. So at the end of the day, uh, that was, you know, the general conditions was great that, that you know, it uh, went away kind of thing. But the um, we really kept on the pressure because as soon as you do extend the, you know, general um, you extend the contract's due date, then that due date moves on a little forward, and then you know there might be another month or two months after that. So it kept on the heat during those last three months to be able to make sure that we could stay as close as possible to the original schedule. And that project only ended up two months late. Uh, very good product, you know, very good project overall. Quality was good, um, and we were only two months late, which was you know I thought was pretty good. It could have been worse on that. Okay. I'll uh, throw in a question, which is a good segue to this. Someone asked here, how do you make sure people are following the right approval processes? And what you have up on the screen here is a particular change order. Now, is this one that you would develop, I guess, or, or refining with your team to enforce a certain process? Well, we're working now to look into um, moving from a forms process um, to a workflow process. So instead of just moving a form around, we're looking at actually similar to what we've already Im implemented a budget process. So um, let me see here. If I press the right button, would that take me back or to the previous slide? Yeah, and then just to highlight the previous uh, button there, right on the second one down. Oh, okay. There you go. Um, so right now, this is done by uh, through an e-build or through a form. But it's very simple. See, this is um, uh, very complicated. We start moving the paper back and forth and so on. But at the end of the day, it's the rebuild that we simplified it. And it was very important to us to simplify it because we have enough de you know, issues to deal with. Um, not, you know, it's really important to keep it simple. So um, you, know, you can't go wrong because it, it needs to go to the, con the architect. And the architect goes to the project manager. So there isn't really much you can do wrong as far as following a process, you can say. Then from there on, the project manager knows what to do as far as from our perspective of who he needs to take it to. He needs to take it to me for approval. And then after that, if I approve it, it goes to the VP. So it's overall, if you look at the big picture, it's very complicated. But we've been able to simplify it uh, through eBuilder. And what helps a lot is that the accurate information is always available to make a, a decision by you know by going to the form on eBuilder. Great, uh, Guillermo. I'm going to rapid fire a handful of questions. If you want to just give me short answers, because there's quite a few of them, and I will tell you that I've probably never seen so many questions. I suspect because of your role, there's very few decision makers at your level that also understand and use the technology on a regular basis. So. One here is, are the inspectors involved in reviewing any aspects of the monthly applications from the GC? Oh, absolutely. They review the uh, a pencil draft. And uh, since they're out on the field, they have a really good grasp on what percentages have been completed. We also have a senior resident construction manager on site and uh, who does architectural inspections also. So yes, they, they review those. Okay, we had a bunch of questions about what ERP or enterprise resource planning software, and they put examples of SAP or PeopleSoft, do you use? 
and have you been able to integrate the cost information with eBuilder? We are in the process of, uh, UT Southwestern is in the process of implementing uh, PeopleSoft. Uh, we've already met with them and figured out ways of integrating, and um, they've delayed the, the implementation throughout the UT Southwestern campus for some reason for one year. So we're not pursuing it right now, but it looks like they've figured out how to do it. It's just that they, they need more time for other issues on the campus to, to be able to implement PeopleSoft. But we're looking forward to it, and they've confirmed that you know uh, when accounting gets the invoices, so on, we'll have more. Uh, you can say live data from the accounting department um, when they make payments. Okay. Uh, do contractors log directly into eBuilder, and do contractors with their own TM systems abandon its use, or do they import data from their contractor systems into eBuilder? How have you handled that? They, um, there was one contractor that abandoned uh, the use of their software and started using RFIs and so on, submitting everything through here to... Um, because it didn't make sense to double entry, place double entry. Um, because this system also has made it easier for the consultants to respond to it, like for example, it gets sent directly to the architect and you know exactly when you sent it to the architect and that the architect is still uh, sitting on it, no offense to anybody. But, um, but um, you know, everybody has been very cooperative. There has not been any issues about uh, trying to integrate or trying to, what is it called, synchronize the information with their current system or anything like that. So we okay. haven't had an issue like that. Are you using eBuilder for scheduling uh, another person at? We, in a, in a limited ver uh, perspective, so we do have a project schedule. Our department uses um, Microsoft Project. The contract is required to use Primavera, and we do have a consultant who reviews the schedules um, since he's a scheduling consultant has you know his background is primavera and so on but most of the time when we generate a schedule from at the beginning of a project we have key milestones that we like to track those milestones are entered into eBuilder and with the combination of the cost module we can because of the, we enter the milestones in the schedule module we're able to create cash flows that are pretty accurate and reliable I'll let you finish up the slides, and we can end off with a bunch of the remaining questions. Yeah, and, and I'll quickly go through this. So just to let everybody know, we, we're implementing, we've implemented this budget process. So as you can see, um, I think um, everybody knows how we, there's budget changes throughout the project. We may move money, uh, money from project contingency to serve some equipment. Uh, maybe a doctor or somebody has requested that we didn't know about before. So we may add money to the equipment. But how do we get all this stuff approved uh, to make sure that a year from now someone says, whatever happened to the money that we used to have in the project contingency, uh, and who authorized that $5 million to be transferred to the equipment budget uh, for any doctor or so-and-so to be approved? So we wanted to take advantage of this new project and make sure that from day one we had a process that everybody was on board. Um, and then, so what we did is we, as you can see, our CIP department is here. Here are the budget revision process. You know, the PM gets to review it, and if, I, if he's okay with it, gets to me and so on. This, um, this whole flow chart is a little busy, but it's, it's actually related to logic, related to what's needed for the process. But as you can see over here, uh, my boss is Kirby Vale, who's a VP, and then um, the budget process gets to him. If I approve it, it gets to him for approval. And then there's certain criteria. If it goes over $100,000, the budget revision, it needs to go to um, the business affairs office. And here's Michael Serber, who represents, uh, he's kind of our key person there in that office to make sure that his boss approves it and is okay with it. So all the budget revisions are being tracked and uh, documented from day one. And I've been in that situation where someone, you know, three years later says, whatever happened to that three or four million dollars we had in this line item? And you have to go back in history to try to confirm and find the files that how, you know, who approved the changes and so on. So the risk associated with not having that available and, 
and uh, and you know being transparent is right here. Um, so a neat thing that's happened uh, last year that happened the begin the beginning of this year too is that Kirby Vale and and this office actually uh, welcome to be part of it. You know, it's one of those things that sometimes people say, "Oh no, I don't want to have access to another software um, that I have to deal with." So. Uh, they actually asked me could they have access to it, and I was really excited about that because our goal is to be transparent and for them to be part of it so that you know they can clearly see what's going on in our projects and at any time you know be able to ask the right questions about anything that might concern them that they see. So anyway, so allow me to just make a commentary here. Mm -hmm. um, this is just a personal commentary. But what you just talked about on the screen of these very specific structured type of processes, change order mm -hmm. processes, where the system is forcing your users to follow a process in a very specific way. And, and you've chosen to have the budget change and two or three other processes, you're, you're, you're moving to a structured environment, but many of the other ones are not structured. They're more flexible than you talked about. Um, why did you make a decision to, number one, start with the flexible workflow first? Uh, and how's the transition been moving a few of those to a more structured environment? Because we have had clients that have struggled. Either they don't have their processes well defined or they create these processes in a bubble. And then when the user starts to use them, they feel that their hands are tied behind their back. So um, how have you dealt with that or, or have you not released this to the team to really answer that question properly? Well, and this one because we had more players involved, we had administration involved, and it was very important to make sure that the budget changes occur um, in a timely manner to make sure that we understand clearly where it is in the process of getting budget approved. We felt that it was important for us to move in the direction of uh, the process, workflow, I guess we call it, right? Is that the right term, John? That's right, yeah. So, um, so this one is... Uh, Definitely our first time that we went in to use this process, and it makes a lot, a lot of sense because there is a process to go through it, and um, and this allows us to to be able to send it to the right appropriate one automatically uh, when it's a because it's actually one of the big challenges that we have is different criterias are involved. Which one does it go to the uh, to my boss for approval? Which one does not go to my boss for approval? Which one goes to the CEO? Which one has to go to the executive committee? And they're in the process. There's one that has to put us. There's kind of a stop and says, "Hold it! This has to be approved by the executive committee," which are rules that we put in to make sure that we follow. And that's why this one uh, is we decided to go to the process because it is a little bit more complicated than just sending a form. Because with a form, you could send it around and you could miss uh, one of those criterias, and we've in included all these criterias in this process. Um, in the change order, we definitely, at the beginning when we implemented eBuilder, we wanted to keep it simple um, to make sure that the implementation went smooth and quick, and, uh, and that's why we stuck to the forms module until we got a good feel for the software and how it works, and now that's why we're moving into the next, we're kicking it up a notch, you can say. Uh, bringing bringing this, which is really appropriate. We're really excited. This has really worked out really good in uh, in making the budget changes uh, because of all the criteria that are involved in which items, which budget changes require certain level of approvals. Okay, Guillermo, I know that you didn't have a specific slide on reporting. But what I'm going to do here, if you'll allow me, is I have one of the reports that you had given. Um, us a while back, and uh, I'll give control back uh, to your screen here in a minute, but could you maybe just talk to how you came about with this report um, from eBuilder and how it's been utilized? And well, um, um, UT System has a standard of reports that are, being, are reported to the board in Austin, and actually this form has been modified already because they updated their, their, their board report. So uh, this one is a while ago, John. But uh, we've actually updated a little further. So we've incorporated all the cost information um, that was required or was a standard at UT system 
because we do report through uh, OFBC to the board the status of all the projects. And um, so we were able to um, uh, you know, pull the information from eBuilder, the, the information is being entered in the cost module, and generate this template, which is very similar to the, um, the board uh, template, you can say, that they're used to reporting in. And we just wanted to be consistent with whatever process and whatever forms they use. So um, the more recent one is a little bit uh, more simplified. They've gone to a more simplified version, but that's pretty much it. Okay. And uh, I know you just have these last two slides, and then uh, we'll, we'll maybe, we might go over another five minutes. I'll try to wrap up some of these other sure. questions. And then others that we haven't answered, uh, we will get an answer uh, individually uh, afterwards. So um, just to wrap up, you know, the benefits, um, I mentioned the project issues. Uh, one of the neat things about it is that, that nothing gets forgotten, nothing falls through a crack, um, nothing, uh, you know, quote, unquote, I put in the presentation here goes away, you know, it's like that um, nagging issue that never goes away, you know, it always hangs around until somebody says, you know, don't include it on in the meeting minutes, but... Um, it just doesn't go away until it's resolved, and if for some reason um, it does get closed out and it you know it comes back to life, you can always pull it back and say, "All right, well, this definitely didn't go away. Here it is again." You know, so um, it's it's a huge uh, from a controlling all the issues that are going on on the site, it being able to manage and keeping track of all these uh, juggling all these balls in the air as far as the issues and so on has been a huge benefit. Um, change order management tremendous uh, has improved tremendously because of our use of the forms module, being able to clearly document the comments, what we're asking the contractor to provide feedback or you know as far as backup or anything that we disagree with is clearly identified um, and so on. Um, like I said earlier, whenever there's a delay in the project, Contractor is required to submit his claim through eBuilder, which clearly tracks um, when it was submitted and any backup that's associated. We send it over to our scheduling consultant to review it. And again, we want to be fair. So he reviews the schedule, the claim, and so on, and the architect reviews it too, and then they provide their feedback. Now, the typical way is you get a letter from the contractor, and you could get different letters, different letter, you know, correspondence, and all these documents are adding up into a folder of a claim and so on. So uh, what we do is we centralize all that information into one form, and all of it is kept in eBuilder under one form. So then, like I said, we're responsible for our own quality assurance program, so we all our inspections occur, uh, are documented in eBuilder. We have created, at the beginning of the project, we, we uh, asked the contractor to um, subdivide the, the project in a reasonable in reasonable size of modules uh, or zones so we can track the inspections and then each zone has a form that we track all the results of the inspection and he has access to those uh, permits so he knows where he stands on each zone as far as inspections. Um, cost module, thank God we're, we moved away from Excel spreadsheet, that's all I have to say. Document module is a huge benefit of having all the centralized information uh, in one location. Um, the neat thing about it also is that external uh, consultants like our materials testing people who do concrete testing can uh, send a report directly to eBuilder so it saves everybody from saving it onto their computer so we have all shared information. And then I just mentioned the, the managing the budget changes which has, we just implemented, and uh, it's working out really good, and we're very happy with it. So, but um, I know we're out of time, and just wanted to uh, offer anybody who's seriously considering, uh, you know, uh, looking into eBuilder, if that's the case. Um, I've always uh, offered, especially, you know, the peers, my peers, other owners and facilities people, um, that I offer to always, if you want to see how I use it, we use it here. A little bit more in detail. I have always told the builder that you know, please uh, uh, feel free to to schedule a go-to meeting, and I'll show you exactly how we use it. And uh, to eliminate that fear that happens of uh, related to buying a new software, 
where everybody has, you know, everybody promises, uh, I guess, the sky, but, uh, you know, can they deliver? It's a big commitment because after you get into it, uh, turning around uh, is not easy. So, uh, so it's, I, you know, I, I offer it because uh, I think it's very valuable for everybody who's seriously considering to contact someone else who has actually been using it and go through it and see what they have to, how they use it 